Before we get into the reign of Wudi, I thought I'd do a short episode on Confucianism in the early Han Dynasty, as a bit of context for those who want it. We're going to talk about what exactly it meant to be a Confucian at this time, and what place Confucians and Confucianism held under these first emperors. During the spring and autumn period, a new type of institution evolved in China, that of the school, where a single wise man gathered around him disciples and students, who could number in the hundreds. The word we translate in this context as school is jia, which can also mean home or family. These organisations were private affairs, they did not arise from state sponsorship. Some of the teachers were willing to teach any man who was willing to learn, and others charged fees. However, there were of course practical limitations on the sort of people who could afford to spend their days studying rather than working to feed their family. Most of the students came from the sons of the aristocracy, or perhaps from the ranks of wealthy commoners. Confucius is traditionally considered the first significant teacher of this sort. His focus as a teacher, and the thing that really distinguishes the Confucian tradition, was his interest in the rituals and art of the early Zhou court. The early Zhou was fondly imagined as a golden age of order and virtue. Two texts, the Book of Documents and the Book of Odes, were especially important as repositories of information on this era. The Documents was a collection of historical speeches, proclamations, and the like. The Book of Odes was a collection of poetry from the Zhou court and from its various vassal states. In the later ages, the term Ru, or classicist, came to be conflated with the more specific group of people who followed the teachings of Confucius. What distinguished Confucius from previous scholars who were interested in these works was that he used them as a basis to form his own moral teachings. Thus, historian Robert P. Kramers defines two distinct activities of the Confucian school, preserving ancient traditions and distilling lessons from them that could be applied to their own times. As well as teaching, Confucians often sought employment from various rulers in the hopes that they could cultivate a state whose pedigree of ritual and virtue would be so impressive that the whole empire would voluntarily submit to it and order could be re-established. Both in the personal and the political, the Confucians really saw virtue as a powerful tool, something that could win hearts and minds. It's this sort of thinking that explains why Confucians were often accused of being idealistic. Despite their interest in ancient ritual, the Confucians spearheaded some more radical ideas. While they believed in hereditary aristocracy, they also believed that even commoners could be virtuous, given enough education. But as time went along, more teachers arose and different schools were founded, expounding more radical philosophies. Many of them also drew ideas from the classical texts. The Moists represented the viewpoint of the lower classes. They condemned the elaborate ceremonies advocated by the Confucians as a waste of time and money, and inaccessible to all but the wealthiest. The Taoists scoffed at the Confucians' fixation on Zhou ritual. From their point of view, the Confucians were missing the grander processes of a universe in constant flux, and instead were focusing on a very particular point in time, whose standards no longer applied. The Legalists took a similar line of thinking, and theorised new methods of control. Confucianism did not remain static in the face of such philosophical developments, though. Through the work of men like Mencius and Sun Qing, Confucianism was able to evolve and stay relevant. Mencius was able to provide a high metaphysical framework for the particular ethics Confucius had advocated, and Sun Qing tempered the idealism of earlier Confucians with a more pragmatic political outlook. Thus, throughout the Warring States period, Confucianism was one voice amongst many, but it remained an influential one. Things changed when the Qin Dynasty came to power. Since the time of Shang Yang and Duke Xiao, the Qin state had been crafted by legalist thinkers, whose reforms helped to modernise the state and turn it into an economic and military powerhouse. In 211 BC, the Chancellor Li Si initiated the burning of the books in an attempt by the state to monopolise thought. Private copies of the odes and documents were to be destroyed, and public discussion of these texts was made a capital offence. Those who refused to surrender their copies would be punished. This was the ultimate low point for Confucianism. However, once the general uprising against Qin started, the prospects of Confucianism again changed dramatically. Now there were many powerful men throughout the empire who might be interested in employing them. However, did scholars who had devoted their time to studying ancient ritual really have anything to offer warlords fighting for control of China? Well, let's have a look at some Confucians who ended up working for Liu Bang, the man who would eventually tr- emerge triumphant and establish the Han Dynasty. 
Gao Zhu and many of his close followers had grown up as commoners, working mundane jobs in their local communities. They were practical men who had little familiarity with, and little need for, the texts that so fascinated the literati. Gao Zhu himself had a personal disdain for Confucians. One famous line from the records tells how, after he became the governor of Pei, whenever he received a guest who was wearing the trademark Confucian cap, he would snatch the man's hat and urinate in it. However, as Gao Zhu grew more and more famous, he attracted more people looking to serve him. Some of these people happened to be Confucians, and some of these Confucians happened to help Gao Zhu in important ways. So it seems that over time, his attitude changed from actively hostile to at least somewhat accommodating. The first of these influential Confucians was Li Yiji. He seems to have been born to a moderately well-off family who had fallen on hard times. He had access to books and loved to study them, but it was always a struggle for them to acquire food and clothing. He was reclusive and became known in his town as the, quote, mad scholar. By the time of the uprising against Qin, he was in his 60s. He heard talk of Liu Bang, and when the governor of Pei led his army through Li's region, Li Yiji was able to receive an audience. However, when the elderly man entered Liu's lodge, he was disgusted by what he saw. The boorish upstart was sprawled over a couch, with two servant women washing his feet. Li was so offended that he did not prostrate himself, but instead just bowed and asked if Liu was really intending to lead the nobles against Qin. Gao Zhu cursed Li and asked what he meant by making such an obvious question. Li replied, quote, If you really mean to gather a band of followers and create a righteous army to punish the unprincipled Qin, it is hardly proper for you to receive your elder sprawled about in this fashion. Liu Bang realised the offence he had caused, and quickly corrected things by tidying himself up and offering Li Yiji the seat of honour. This was the beginnings of a fruitful relationship. Li Yiji, with his years of experience and study, was able to teach Liu Bang a little etiquette, so he wouldn't upset important men who were used to high culture. Li ended up working as a diplomat, a role where his eloquent speech really came in handy. Now, while he was a Confucian scholar, the things that he helped Liu Bang with throughout his career didn't have all that much to do with Confucianism. During the war with Xiang Yu, Li was the one who advised Liu Bang about how important it was to hold the Yao granary. The war had utterly disrupted the usual task of farming, he explained, and being able to provide food to the people would help win him support. Quote, the farmer abandons his ploughs and the weaving girl steps down from her loom, for the hearts of the world find no security or rest. I beg you, therefore, to advance your troops with all speed and retake Xingyang. With the grain of the Ao granary as a basis, you may blockade the strategic points. He then goes on to list particular places. In this way, you will demonstrate to the other nobles that you are holding the most strategic points and taking advantage of the circumstance, and the whole world will thenceforth turn to you. Of course, this was an entirely practical insight and could have been offered by anyone with a sharp military or political mind. Furthermore, when Li did offer advice that was couched in Confucian thinking, Gao Zhu's other advisers dismissed it. When Xiang Yu trapped Liu Bang in Xingyang in 204 BC, Liu turned to Li Yiji to see if he had any ideas. Li suggested that they send messengers to the descendants of the old royal houses to say that Liu would enfeef them. He appealed to historical examples and made the argument that such a virtuous act would endear the whole of China to Liu. Quote, if you could only re-establish the descendants of the former kingdoms and present them with seals of enfeoffment, then they, their ministers and their people, being everyone indebted to your virtue, would one and all turn in longing toward your righteousness and beg to become your subjects. With virtue and righteousness made manifest, you might face south and name yourself dictator, and Xiang Yu, gathering his slaves together in respectful salute, would most certainly come to pay homage. This was so idealistic and Confucian in thinking, that it almost comes across as parody. Liu Bang, however, was all for it, and was ready to send Li Yiji on his way with the seals of enfeoffment. But before Li left, Liu Bang told his advisor Zhang Liang about the plan, and when Zhang had Li's arguments repeated to him, he systematically went through the historical precedents Li had used, and showed why they didn't apply to their current situation, and pointed out that promising to re-establish the old kingdoms and their families would only alienate old and new men who were already fighting for Liu, and to whom he had promised land. When Liu realised how bad Li's idea was, he spat out his food and cried, quote, That idiot Confucianist came near to spoiling the whole business for his father. 
referring to himself as Li Yijie's father, was the ancient Chinese version of the timeless insult, I did your mum. The most notable achievement of Li's career was in 204, when he was sent to persuade the king of Qi, Tian Guang, to join Liu Bang's cause. Li painted Tian a pretty portrait of Liu Bang's generosity and the acclaim he had received from worthy men from all over the empire, and contrasted it with the oath-breaking Xiang Yu. He also pointed out that Liu had recently recaptured the strategically desirable position of Xingyang. With these arguments, Li was able to persuade Tian to join Liu's cause. His success rankled some of the more militarily inclined followers of Gao Zhu, who were shocked that a mere Confucianist could achieve the same result as a general. A rhetorician trying to persuade the general Han Xin to ignore Tian's fence jump and invade Qi anyway said, quote, Master Li Yi Ji, by bowing graciously from his carriage and wagging his meager tongue, has conquered the seventy odd cities of Qi, while you, with your army of thousands, needed a year and over before you could gain control of the fifty odd cities of Zhao. Could it be that what you have done in several years as a general is not equal to the accomplishments of one wretched Confucianist? Li's achievement was kind of negated when Han Sim went and conquered Liu's new ally, then demanded that he himself be set up as king of Qi. Poor Li Yiji, who was in the court of Tian Guang when the news of the invasion arrived, was accused of deliberately tricking the king and was boiled alive as punishment. Another Confucian who received acclaim serving Gao Zhu was Lu Jia. We've met him in previous episodes as the envoy who was sent to negotiate with the king of Nanyue, Zhao Tuo, a few times, during the reigns of Gao Zhu and Wendi. Aside from this important role, he impressed on Gao Zhu how the ancient learning contained in the Book of Odes and the Book of Documents would be helpful for creating a political system that could survive in the long term. Gao Zhu had shown his worth as a wartime leader, Lu argued, but a different skill set would be necessary to govern the empire in peace. The idea is encapsulated in a dialogue between Lu Jia and Gao Zhu, where the emperor was disparaging Lu for constantly bringing up the classical texts. The exasperated Gao Zhu said to Lu Jia, quote, All I possess I have won on horseback. Why should I bother with the odes and documents? Lu Jia retorted, quote, Your majesty may have won it on horseback, but can you rule it on horseback? He then went through some historical examples of kings who had won the empire through military force, but had kept it through encouraging civil obedience. Finally, he came to the Qin dynasty. Quote, Qin entrusted its future solely to punishments and laws, without changing with the times, and thus eventually brought about the destruction of its ruling family. If, after it had united the world under its rule, Qin had practiced benevolence and righteousness and modelled its ways on the sages of antiquity, how would your majesty ever have been able to win possession of the empire? The implication was, of course, that Gao Zhu ought to start practicing the Confucian virtues of benevolence and righteousness if he wanted to keep safe what he had won. The reprimand humbled Gao Zhu, who realized that relying on strength and force alone would doom the Han Dynasty to the same short-lived existence as the Qin. He commissioned Lu Jia to write a guide on political techniques, and when Lu got around to presenting each completed chapter to Gao Zhu, the emperor was very pleased. The work is known as Xin Yu, meaning new words or new discourses. It elaborated on what Lu Jia saw as the causes of the downfall of Qin, and how the Han could avoid the same problems by practicing Confucian virtue. During the reigns of Hui Di and Empress Liu, Lu Jia realized he would not be able to prevent the empress from empowering her own family and decided to play it safe by returning to his hometown and keeping out of political life. However, he did have one important impact during this time, which was to suggest to the Chancellor Chen Ping the idea of forming a political alliance with the Supreme Commander Zhao Bo. These two men were later instrumental in the coup against the Liu family. When Wendy ascended the throne, he sent Lu Jia on another, on another mission to Nanyue, and shortly after that, Lu Jia died of old age. Perhaps the most important Confucianist of Gao Zhu's reign was Xu Sun Tong. Xu Sun's great contribution was to invent the court ritual for the Han Dynasty. It might seem somewhat inconsequential to us, but think about how much presentation can communicate authority, even in the present day. If our politicians all gathered at a pub wearing their trackies to pass new legislation, we'd probably have even less faith in them. Now consider how much more important presentation would be for a dynasty that had essentially risen out of nowhere and now claims suzerainty over the whole known world. 
There was no external authority decreeing Liu Bang to be the rightful emperor, no concrete process such as an election which entrusted him with sovereignty. If Gaozu was saying that he was the son of heaven, he needed to look and act the part. Moreover, his followers were a lot of them rustic and simple men, and needed ritual to guide them into behaviour more appropriate for governors. To help draw up the court rituals for Han, Gaozu turned to Shu Sun Tong. Now Shu Sun was a fairly interesting guy. Though he was nominally a Confucian, he could see the limitations of the philosophy, and had a bit of an adaptive, heterodox approach. For one thing, he had actually begun his career under the basically anti-Confucian Qin government, but managed to avoid trouble by keeping his philosophy to himself and just telling the emperor what he wanted to hear. Before the rebellion broke out, he managed to leave the capital and return to his hometown. There, he formed a following of about a hundred students. When Liu Bang rose to prominence as governor of Pei, Xu Sun met with him, and knowing Liu's dislike of Confucians, decided not to wear the robes that marked him as one. During the war with Xiang Yu, he helped Liu by recommending him men who would be useful in Liu's army. He tended to recommend the sorts of people whom his students found unsavory, outlaws, brigands, and gangsters. His students got upset with him for promoting these sorts of men while leaving good Confucians like themselves with nothing. He told them, quote, The King of Han is at the moment busy dodging arrows and missiles in a struggle for control of the world. What could a lot of scholars like you do in such a fight? Therefore, I have first recommended the sort of men who can cut off the heads of enemy generals and seize their penance. Wait a while, I won't forget you. Essentially, he had come to the same conclusion that Lu Jia had. The skills needed for winning the empire and ruling it were different. Once Liu Bang was successful, his students' abilities could be put to good use. When the war was over, and the new Emperor Gao Zhu came to Shu Sun with worries about the rowdy behaviour of his followers, they were going about the palace drunk and hacking wooden pillars with their swords. Shu Sun told him, quote, Confucian scholars are not much use when one is marching to conquest, but they can be of help in keeping what has already been won. I beg to summon some scholars of Lu who can join with my disciples in drawing up a ritual for the court. Lu was the birthplace of Confucius, and the tradition was strong there. That's why he wanted to summon scholars of Lu. Gaozu approved the plan, but asked Shu Sun not to make the ritual too complicated. As he said, quote, Keep in mind that it must be the sort of thing I can perform. Shu Sun drew on an eclectic mix of sources to formulate the ritual, including elements of Qin ceremonies and more ancient codes. This would have raised eyebrows of the more orthodox Confucians, who probably would have wanted to imitate as closely as possible the rites of the old Western Zhou court. In fact, some of the scholars whom Shu Sun invited refused to join the project, as they felt that a hundred years needed to pass after the establishment of a dynasty before it could codify its ritual, and they accused Shu Sun of departing from examples set by antiquity. Shu Sun laughed at them, considering them stuck in the past. He said, quote, True peak headed Confucianists you are indeed. You do not know that the times have changed. Eventually, the plans for the ritual were completed and when Gao Zhu had a read over them, he approved. It was decided to perform it for the first time at the beginning of the new year, which coincided with the completion of the Changle Palace. And so, in the tenth month of the seventh year, winter 202-1 BC, all the nobles and officials came to court and attended the ceremony. Here's how it's described in the records. Quote, Before dawn, the master of guests, who was in charge of the ritual, led the participants in order of rank through the gate leading to the hall. Within the courtyard, the chariots and cavalry were drawn up. The foot soldiers and palace guards stood with their weapons at attention and their banners and pennants unfurled, passing the order along to the participants to hurry on their way. At the foot of the hall stood the palace attendants, lined up on either side of the stairway, several hundred on each step. The distinguished officials, nobles, generals, and other army officers took their places on the west side of the hall facing east while the civil officials from the Chancellor on down proceeded to the east side of the hall facing west. The Master of Ceremonies then appointed men to relay instructions to nine degrees of guests. At this point, the Emperor, born on a litter, appeared from the inner rooms, the hundred officials holding banners and announcing his arrival. Then each of the guests, the nobles and kings down to the officials of 600 pickles' salary, was summoned in turn to come forward and present his congratulations, and from the nobles down, everyone trembled with awe and reverence. When the ceremony was finished, ritual wine was brought out. 
All those seated in attendance in the hall bowed their heads to the floor, and then, in the order of their rank, each rose and drank a toast to the emperor. When the tankard had passed around nine times, the master of guests announced the conclusion of the toasts. The grand secretary was charged with seeing that the regulations were followed, and anyone who did not perform the ceremony correctly was promptly pulled out of line and expelled from the hall. During the drinking which followed the formal audience, there was no one who dared to quarrel or misbehave in, in the least. With this, Emperor Gaozu announced, Today, for the first time, I realized how exalted a thing it is to be an emperor. He appointed Shu Sun Tong his master of ritual and awarded him with 500 caddies of gold. With his new position, Shu Sun was able to fulfill his promise to his students and have them appointed as officials in the government. He was later appointed as the senior tutor to the heir apparent, the future Hui Di. In Hui Di's reign, he continued to impart some advice on matters of protocol and helped devise the funerary practices for a deceased emperor. It seems he lived out the rest of his life fairly peacefully, as we are not actually told how he died in the records. Because of his contributions to the ritual of Han, and his bringing many Confucian to the civil service, Sima Chen calls him, quote, the father of Confucian scholars for the house of Han. Confucians continued to serve as academicians for the imperial court after the death of Gao Zhu. However, hardly any rose to prominence under the rulers that followed him. Empress Liu was more interested in promoting the members of her family, and moreover, the government was still filled with the men of action who had fought for Gao Zhu. Wendy appointed some, though Sima Chen says he was more interested in legalist ideas. Jing Di appointed a few, but due to the influence of Empress Dao Jidor, a committed Taoist who was quite hostile to Confucians, his reign was not a fun time for Confucians at the royal court. One unfortunate academician, Yuan Yu, was made to fight pigs in the palace sty after he poo-pooed the works of Lao Zi to the empress. However, I will talk some more about one man, whom we've already talked a bit about previously, Jia Yi. Jia Yi was the man who, among other things, suggested the idea of breaking up kingdoms into smaller parts by enfeeding multiple royal relatives when the reigning king died. He was fond of the Book of Odes, which he could supposedly recite at length. Some of his propositions to Wen Di are contained in the work called Sin Shu, or New Writings. It is similar in basic concept to Lu Jia's Sin Yu. It looks at the failings of Qin to see what the hand could do to succeed in the long term, and finds its answer in the practice of Confucian virtues. Jia was also famous for his literary ability. Two of his poems are recorded in the records, and his style was an inspiration to a flourishing literary culture under Wu Di. There was one suggestion that he made that was not taken up, but it is important for the upcoming episodes. I've mentioned the five-phase theory a few times, which links succeeding dynasties with different elements, colours, seasons, and a whole host of other things. When the Han Dynasty was established, it had actually retained the symbols of the Qin Dynasty, the element water, the colour black, and the season winter. Now, declaring a new phase had started wasn't something you could just do willy-nilly, which is why it hadn't been done yet. When Emperor Wen ascended the throne, Jia Ye considered that, as the Han Dynasty was now 20 years old, and the Empire was at peace, they were in a confident enough position to declare that a new phase had, indeed, started. The next element in the cycle was Earth, which was associated with the colour yellow, Midsummer, and the number 5, among other things. So Jia Ye recommended changing the time of the new year, the penance, and other things accordingly. However, Wendy felt that the time was not yet right, so it was not done. As we mentioned in the episode of on Wendy, although Jia Ye's ideas found traction with the emperor, he himself did not have a particularly successful career and ended his life by suicide. He was seen as a sort of tragic hero in later times, a man whose talents were not fully recognised and who died unfulfilled. Aside from these more eminent men, there were a number during the early Han Dynasty who developed interpretations of the different texts that eventually came to be grouped together as the five classics. Some of them achieved positions of government. Han Ying, a scholar of the Book of Odes, was made an erudite under Wen Di, and senior tutor to the King of Changshan under Jing Di. Su of Lu had studied the Book of Rites and was made Grand Master of Rites under Wen Di. Others carried on their work mostly in private. Fu Sheng had served as an academician during the Qin Dynasty, and was credited with saving the Book of Documents from complete destruction after the burning of the books. The Han court called upon him, but he was by this time too old to travel to Chang'an. 
These men and others passed on their ideas about their particular text of expertise onto various disciples, and a number of interpretations arose. In his chapter known as the Biographies of Confucian Scholars, Sema Chan groups them all together and draws out the intellectual lineages, but we won't go into detail on it. For us, it's enough to know that this stuff was happening in the background. So, at the anticipation of Wudi's reign, we see that Confucianism was not in a particularly strong position. It had survived the Qin Dynasty, and Confucians had made some important contributions already to the Han. However, they were just one group of thinkers, and not an especially favoured one, competing with other schools of thought, and with men who weren't aligned with any particular school at all. As we'll see next in the upcoming episodes though, their fortunes are about to change. It was during the reign of Wu Di that Confucianism found a strong political foothold, from which it grew to attain the philosophical hegemony that we think of as being an essential aspect of imperial China. The classifications of Confucianist and Classicist is one of the most debated questions of Chinese historiography, and what I've said here is quite a simplistic take. It's especially difficult when we're talking about the era prior to Emperor Wu, where the records is really our chief source. It's not exactly clear what Sima Chen meant when he describes a particular person as a Wu, or Classicist, and whether that's a label that would have been recognised by the subjects of his work. Much of early modern scholarship on Chinese philosophy was based on post hoc distinctions made by traditional historians, without adequately considering the extent to which these distinctions are historically valid. It'd be beyond my capabilities to provide even a summary of contemporary scholarship on the issue. So, now more importantly than ever, I'd like to reiterate that I'm not an historian. Thank you.